Let's talk Dehancer. If you aren't familiar with the tool, it's a group of plugins for DaVinci Resolve and other software trying to inspire the process of developing filmic-like looks and textures for your projects. Today, I'm going to be doing a comprehensive walkthrough of all the tools Dehancer has to offer and help you decide which and when to add these tools into your workflow. If you want to skip the walkthrough and jump right to my recommendations, go to the time code on the screen. Before I get too deep, I wanted to send a disclaimer out there that Dehancer did reach out to me and they asked if they gave me access to the tool for a month, would I do a review of their product? Now, their team was very clear that they're not asking for anything other than my honest opinion. They did offer an affiliate link so that as people purchase the products, I would get a commission on the sale. Admittedly, because I'm not some sort of gigantic YouTube channel, I asked them instead if we could just offer everyone a discount code because I'd rather you save money than me make a couple extra bucks. And they said yes. So at the end of the video, you will find a 10% off code and their team insisted they still wanted to include a small thank you commission along the way. So just know if you use the code, you'll save money and you'll, uh, you'll add to my coffee funds. So here we've got a little basic testing timeline and I'm actually going to uh, hide the clips for this little bit. So here we have Dehancer and the only really thing I have going on is just some basic color management. So this is working in DaVinci Wide Gamut. You'll see that I've set uh, Dehancer to be expecting uh, DaVinci Wide Gamut and DaVinci Intermediate on the way in. If you're new to color management, uh, take a look at some of my other videos. That's a bit of a longer topic than we have time to cover today. Under this input tab, we have uh, some kind of corrective elements here. So this could be, you know, if your footage is a little overexposed, you could grab the exposure slider and drop it down. What I find is uh, the, the idea behind Dehancer is far more of trying to build a big picture look rather than clip to clip adjustments. So if, if you are adjusting things in the timeline level, you probably aren't going to want to be messing with these too much. Now, Film Developer, this, uh, this tool is also included in uh, Dehancer Pro as well as Dehancer light if you just like this. The idea with um, Film Developer, and I'll hit the uh, enable check mark here, is this is where we're starting to add global contrast for our projects. Let me pull up the uh, the waveform here. So you can see, you know, we're starting to add some sort of global look contrast. If we look at this on a another test clip here, we can kind of see what it looks like if we enable and disable it. So one of the things that I, uh, I would really love if Dehancer would consider adjusting is whenever we add contrast, I never want to adjust the middle gray point because the cinematographer often very carefully sets the middle gray point. And so uh, we can correct it with this gamma correction. So let me show you here. I am going to pull up the, uh, the mid gray point. And if you look down here in the waveform, this gray line right here is representing the mid gray of uh, DaVinci Intermediate. And you'll notice as I enable Dehancer, it's significantly adjusting the mid gray point. So the, the good news is, is they give us uh, this, gamma con this gamma correction where we can actually adjust where the uh, kind of that pivot point of the contrast is being added. So let me do a little on off here. We can kind of adjust this back to a more neutral pivot point. So that's pretty close. Good enough for the, uh, the demonstration here. So what you'll find is, as I now enable and disable this contrast from Dehancer, you're adding contrast but we're not brightening or darkening the image. It would be a huge time saver if the uh, gamma correction level could automatically be tied to whatever the mid gray point is of the source. Color separation, uh, basically the way this works is as we add contrast, we also increase saturation. If you don't want that to be the case, you could drop the color saturation slider. So in this case, you're just adding contrast. You're not also adding um, saturation along the way. Color boost is like it sounds. This is just uh, adding saturation at the very beginning of this pipeline. From there, we get into some of their film profile options. Uh, so uh, the Kodak Vision 3 250D is one of them. And there, there's a whole bunch uh, that you can play around with and adjust. I'm not gonna pass judgment on how good or bad these are since I think so many of them come down to taste. I think if I were to give any feedback for Dehancer at this point of the process, I would say that I wish there was an intensity slider so we could kind of control how intense the effect is. I know I could put this on a separate node and adjust the opacity, but it, it feels so simple to adjust if there was just an opacity slider. 
Alternatively, there's so many options to choose from that it'd be really great if there was some sort of document that could show us, hey, here are the creative adjustments that tend to happen in each of these. So, you know, if you're gonna use the uh, Kodak Vision 350D, what are some of the characteristics of that? I wanna take a moment here and talk about film emulation philosophy. So I think when you're presented with a really big list of options, it can be easy to feel overwhelmed. And what I want you to take away from this is, it's not about caring about perfect film emulation because perfect film emula emulation is not necessarily a solid target. As an example, there's a whole bunch of Kodak 2383 LUTs out there, and all of them are a little different due to the preferential elements of the designer behind them. If the film look was some perfect solid target, well, there would be no difference between these various tools. The film compression is a nice effect, and let me enable it here. You'll notice that as I enable and disable it, it's dropping the very top end of the highlights. So this is nice because uh, sometimes you wanna build in a slightly more milky highlight, and uh, I do this all the time with the curves tool, but you know, if you're looking for something more out of the box, if I disable it, you'll notice the sky's a little brighter. If I enable it, it starts to kind of make the highlights a little more of that smooth roll off. The expand tool is here just to adjust the uh, the black points or the white points of the image. Uh, this functions very similarly to the lift and the gain tools. The print section allows a variety of uh, output settings. So if you were going to actually go to a film projection, uh, you could output to uh, Cine and Film Log, but then they also have the classic, you know, Kodak uh, 2383 emulation and the uh, Fuji 3513. Now, both of these uh, I really like, and I feel like Kodak's 2383 look is requested so often that it's really nice to just have this available as an additional option for that look. From there, we can do things like adjust the white point of the image if we wanted a really warm white point, the exposure, uh, as well as, you know, color density. Uh, we talked about this previously, the idea that the more saturated color, the darker it gets, that slider would do that. Uh, I would adjust it here, but on this image, it's just basically grayscale, so you won't see a lot. And then uh, if you want to drop all saturation out of the image, you know, you, uh, you have the saturation slider there. Some people might enjoy combining both a print and a negative option. So you could, you know, do a, a Kodak Vision 3 and a uh, 2383. So you're combining a negative with a positive. Uh, some of the results are nice, some of them are not. It's there to be experimented around with. The color head here is trying to lean into some of those, um, you know, uh, balance elements. So they're leaning into maybe a slightly more subtractive approach to adding color here. The thing is, is rarely for a whole film am I gonna be wanting to tint, you know, the, the entire project blue. Maybe, maybe on a scene by scene basis. But if, if I'm just doing shot balancing, uh, most of the time I'm not gonna be messing with the uh, global timeline settings. I'll just be touching the, uh, the primary controls on the clip level. They also have some interesting ways of kind of making some uh, basic split toning here. So, you know, we could uh, drag the shadows a little cooler, the highlights a little warmer. Uh, personally, I find it more intuitive to work in the, uh, the curves panel down here, but I think it's a good option if you're experimenting or trying to put something together real quick. The next tool is film grain. And uh, I gotta say, I am really enjoying some of the grain options in this tool. Uh, the first thing that stuck out to me is they have presets built in for 65 millimeter film, which is awesome. I realize with YouTube compression, uh, you might not be able to uh, see the grain here. Like, let me, let me play it for a little bit. But uh, Resolve, although in DaVinci Resolve, you can kind of produce your own 65 uh, emulation for grain, it's so great that they build it right here into the tool. What's cool is you can select any of these options and then go over to custom and now now you can set the uh, you can customize the parameters of the preset that you were just working on. I think the single most important element from here that you'll want to keep an eye on is this film resolution slider. Let me test this out on a separate clip here. Let's jump over to this uh, airy test clip. The film resolution slider, the lower this number is, the more blurring will occur. So if I set that to zero, do you see this blurring? If you do not want blurring on, or, on your footage, you're gonna wanna make sure this is set to 100. And many of the presets here, so if I select, you know, maybe we'll select the uh, 35 millimeter 500 ISO, many of the presets do have some sort of blurring built into it. So just know that if you're gonna use this, be careful and maybe jump over to the customized tool and click this over to 100 unless you are purposely wanting to blur that footage. 
Next is Halation. Now this is an example of one of those tools that you could buy separately if you like it. Uh, and there's a, uh, a bunch of great presets. I love this idea of uh, a regular version and then a uh, no remjet version. If you're not familiar with remjet, it's basically a, uh, a layer that's often added to motion picture film that is attempting to reduce the effects of halation. But uh, if we take it off, uh, we get a little extra. What's interesting about Remjet is I know a lot of people like the, uh, the Cinestill film for film photography, and I believe Cinestill doesn't have Remjet, which I think is why it has such interesting halation with Cinestill. There's a bunch of interesting options at various levels of intensity, but once again, I think there's one feature over in the custom menu that you really need to be aware of, and that is global diffusion. So global diffusion is adding this warm push to the, uh, the whole image. So let me drop out uh, global diffusion here. You'll notice that uh, when I turn that off, we're just getting the uh, halation glow. And let me let me jump down to a more obvious option just for YouTube to make sure you can see it. Uh, if I drop out global diffusion, I'm no longer affecting the white point of the image. I'm just adding this nice glow to the highlights. So most of the time uh, when I'm using halation, I do not want a white point adjustment. So this is gonna be set to zero most of the time for me. Now, Bloom here is one of the more subtle effects if I kind of turn this on and off. This is trying to add a little bit of that, you know, if you have that maybe a vintage lens going on, some of the softest that might come through for it. Uh, there is, you can kind of do a variation of this uh, in Resolve with the Halation tool if you pull out a lot of the saturation. Uh, I think it's a nice adjustment, but uh, when I was messing with it, I feel like I was wanting to customize it a lot. So it's not one of those tools that I felt like I love the results right out of the box. I often was needing to jump into the, uh, the custom menu and uh, really get into the details. This film damage effect here might be best illustrated on something a little more simple. So let me kind of play it on this clip. You'll see it's uh, a bunch of the scratches and the hairs going on. I've chosen the Super 8 because it's uh, a little more obvious. Uh, something similar does come in Resolve. I think this is a good alternative, but I would probably start with the free version in Resolve, and then if you're not satisfied there, then consider moving towards this plugin. So the Film Breath tool is actually one of the tools where as soon as I started using it, I really was excited. And that's because, uh, take a look at what this is doing here. It's flickering the exposure, contrast, and then the white point of the image. And you can control these individually under the uh, custom tab. So like, let's say you only wanted to flicker the, uh, the color, you could drop the uh, tonal contrast and the exposure flicker. And right now you just kind of get the, uh, the wiggling of the uh, overall balance of the image. While you can recreate this with some work in Resolve, it's just such an easy tool to use and does exactly what I want that uh, this will absolutely be in the toolkit moving forward. I love the Film Breath tool. Now, Gate Weave, once again, I'm gonna set it to a higher setting so you can see it. Uh, gate Weave is that subtle shake of the uh, the film going through the gate of the camera. Uh, most of the time, uh, you wouldn't use it on something uh, like with this level of intensity. But I have found that uh, when we are producing a more textured filmic look, that something really subtle might work. Now, uh, I've built my own presets inside DaVinci Resolve using the Camera Shake plugin that produce uh, exactly what I'm looking for when it comes to uh, the shake. Uh, my version is a little closer to what uh, Steve Yedlin has outlined. However, if you're looking for something a little more stylistic, uh, a little more aggressive maybe, uh, I think the, uh, the gate weave tools in here could uh, serve you well. To wrap up, we have a vignette tool here, which uh, works well enough, but most of the time I'm not setting a vignette on a uh, timeline level. And then also we have a nice little uh, false color uh, tool uh, if you need it. And then they have this uh, clipping indication box, which uh, works very similarly to my uh, clip safe DCTL that I released for free not too long ago. So now the question is, which of these elements do I most recommend? Now, of course, if you like all these elements, you can just get Dehancer Pro and all of it's gonna be included. But if you're looking at some of the individual components, here's how I am thinking through what components I like best, especially out of the box. Well, I feel like top of the list, the easy win is gonna be that Film Breath and Gate Weave plugin. It does exactly what I wanted to do. It is easy to customize. It's just like the easiest win for me. It's going, it is going to be used in the future on my projects. I love it. And I would highly recommend it to you if you're looking for a similar effect.
I feel like the next recommendation I would have is I really do like their Halation plugin. Now, the one in DaVinci Resolve, I've used it for long enough now that I have a really good feel for how it operates. So uh, I think I can, I can get that tool to a place that I really like it quite quickly. But out of the box, I do like how Dehancer operates more than Resolve. So that's something to consider. The grain tool, ah, it's so situational. And when you upload things to you know YouTube or when things go to streaming, things are so compressed that uh, in the end, it might not matter what grain you actually choose because it will all be eaten up in compression. But out of the box, um, I've, I've worked with Resolve's grain so long now that I really do like it, but it doesn't have a quick preset for 65 millimeter grain. So if that's something you're looking for, that could be a really good reason to go with Dehancer's grain option over Resolve. And while the Bloom tool is a nice addition, I think that the Bloom tool feels a little insufficient on its own. I feel like you're gonna to wanna to couple both Bloom and Halation together uh, to complete the effect. Now, Dehancer Lite is pretty much just their like preset catalog. So the question is, do you like their presets? And there's so many in there that it's really hard for me to show or demo them all together. I will say after messing around with them quite a bit, I really do like their Kodak 2383 and their Fuji 3513 print versions. I think those are great. Uh, I'm looking forward to having those in the arsenal. I don't think I will be using as many of the negative options provided in that film tab, but maybe situationally a time might come up where those are useful. The final factor to consider here is the stability of the tool. Now, I have a very capable machine. It's a custom built Windows 10 PC. It's got a NVIDIA RTX 4090 GPU, so it's doing fine. When I run their benchmark software, it says that my system is more than capable of running the tool. But every once in a while, I'm encountering weird kind of random bugs that seem to crash resolve. I've been chatting with support about this and they've been responsive and helpful, but we still haven't solved it 100%. It wouldn't be fair of me to make this review without mentioning it. So my encouragement to you is make sure to try out the tools with one of their shorter licenses at first to make sure that you fully vetted it and worked through any sort of bugs you might encounter before you stick it in front of clients. That probably goes without saying, but I just wanna mention that this has been my experience. Their support team has been great, so don't let that discourage you from trying it out, just test things before you launch it. To get that 10% off code, use my name, Barrett10, at checkout. Uh, just note that a lot of people accidentally leave off that second T in my name, so it's B-A-R-R-E-T-T. -T. Uh, if, if, if you don't put every letter in there, you won't get the discount. So uh, if the code doesn't work, just make sure you're spelling it. Uh, Barrett10, and you'll get that 10% off. Are there any other tools or plugins that you want reviewed? Let me know down in the comments. Also, if you enjoyed this video, hitting the like button will help other people see it and subscribe to stay around to keep seeing more content like this. All right, I'll see you in the next one.